In this video, I'm going to try to compare the SVS Prime Bookshelf versus the SVS Ultra Bookshelf speakers. And I'm going to take a more objective lean in this, which I normally do in my videos, but in this one, since it's honestly been so long since I've heard them, I'm really relying on my notes and the data to help me remember what I heard and explain it all to you in a way that will help you make the right choice. Which speaker is going to be better for you? We'll see. Both of these speakers are two-way speakers. They feature a six and a half inch midwoofer and a one inch dome tweeter. Price is about $5.99 to $6.99 for the Prime and about $11.99 for the Ultra. So what do you get with the Ultra? And that's more where we're gonna focus in this review. The differences that I heard was that the Prime was more audibly forward and more bright in the upper mid range and lower treble region. And we'll see in the data why that tended to be the case. Now, remember that these things are relative. So when I say that it's forward, it could also mean that there is less mid-range and that really happens to be the case in the Prime. I did find that towing both of these speakers out by about 30 degrees really helped to shelve the top end and make them more listenable because both of them out of the box are really just a little bit brighter than I would personally prefer, at least directly aimed on axis. And the Prime really and truly, in my opinion, is not as good as the Ultra tonally. The Ultra is more tonally neutral by quite a bit than the Prime. However, the Ultra speaker isn't quite as neutral as some of the other speakers that I've listened to and I prefer, such as the Revel brand and Kef products. Those generally have a more neutral response because they seem to follow the pattern of using measurements to help get them to an end goal at least in regards to overall neutrality. Now, this doesn't mean that whoever designed the Ultra speaker wasn't using measurements. Something worth mentioning is that these speakers, I believe, are probably 10 years old, maybe even more by now. So when we're looking at the data, we have to keep in mind that these aren't refreshes. These designs are rather old, and 10 years in terms of speaker design is pretty decent bit, especially now that we're seeing more emphasis being put on measurements and how they relate to sound. Here's a picture of the two speakers side by side, and this is roughly to scale. It's not perfect, but it should give you a good idea of how the speakers compare in size. And this is an overall quick table. You can see the SVL's Prime bookshelf. Sensitivity is about 87 dB, and for the Ultra, sensitivity is about 87.8. So they're pretty close. F3 and F10 that you see over here on the far right are also pretty reasonably close. And for those who don't know, the F3 is the point where compared to the average sensitivity, the response has dropped about three decibels. The F10 compared to the average sensitivity is the frequency where the response has dropped about 10 decibels. Using these two gives us an idea of how much bass we can expect to get out of a speaker in our room. All the measurements you're about to look at have been captured using the Clipple Near Field Scanner. It's a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage or my dining room. Seriously. Starting things off is the impedance for the Prime. And we can see that the overall impedance stays above about four ohm. The EPDR does dip below that. And there are some areas where you may have a little bit more trouble if you're listening at higher output volumes or maybe an eight ohm amplifier. Just it's not gonna be capable of driving this speaker like you need. Another thing that I wanted to point out was that this speaker does have a resonance around 250 Hertz, and I highlighted that in this box, which you see right here. Now, let's look at the Ultra. Scales aren't the same, so you'll have to do that comparison on your own, but the story is similar in regards to amplifier power. You're gonna need an amplifier that's four ohm stable. You might be able to use an AVR. I'm not gonna say that you can't, but usually when I see impedances like this, I'm gonna recommend that you use a separate amplifier. Of course, you can always contact SBS. They really have a, a great customer service department and you can ask them what they would recommend as far as amplifier requirements. This is the linearity of the Prime and we can see that, as I said before, SPL is about 87 decibels. And for the most part, the speaker's within plus or minus three decibels, which is reasonable. But the scooped out mid-range to me was noticeable, especially compared to the boosted upper mid-range area and then the dip in the treble right around four to five kilohertz. Now this particular area was just a little bit too bright for me, made things sound a little bit too tinny, especially again, relative to that 
dip down mid-range. Now we're looking at the Ultra and we can see that the Ultra is more linear and does have just a smidgen more SPL. This speaker also has a somewhat again boosted upper mid-range but also mid-range area. It's not quite as severe. For the most part, the speaker is within negative three dB plus one and a half dB on average. I would prefer it to be a little bit more neutral through there and I'm not necessarily sure what causes that if that's a baffle step thing. It kind of looks like it could be somewhat of a baffle step issue and then maybe the tweeter level is just a little bit too low in comparison. But this is gonna make the mix sound a little bit more forward makes things possibly sound a little bit more tinny in the upper mid-range area, as I said, for the Prom speaker. The F3 is at 69 hertz, F10 is at 48 hertz, which I've already talked about, but just to give you an idea of what you can use this information for, the F3 being at 69 hertz is not gonna give you a lot of low bass output, but you also need to know what the F10 is to see what that roll-off rate is, because 69 hertz for F3 could be okay if the F10 is at 20 hertz, that just means it's a very gradual roll off and you might have plenty of bass in your room. But with an F10 just 20 hertz below that, you're not gonna expect a whole lot of 50 hertz kick drum, the slam that I hear people talking about out of a speaker like this. You're gonna to have to use a subwoofer and I would recommend using that subwoofer at the typical 80 hertz region because that will alleviate some of the distortion issues that you're gonna see a little bit later on. For the prime, there is some diffraction that cannot be equalized out. And I'm pointing that out on purpose because the CEA graphics are good for me to get an idea of for a speaker like this that might be used in home theater. Can it be equalized? And yeah, through the mid range you can, but then you got the upper mid range and the treble area. Well, that's going to be harder to equalize. And it looks like there's some sort of crossover issue in that particular area. If we flip over to the ultra, we can see that it smooths out a little bit in terms of the directivity through here. Now, a lot of that is going to be because of the directivity vertically. So the path between the midwoofer and the tweeter above it. And as a sanity check, we'll go back to this graphic and we see that horizontally, there is some degradation in the directivity index, but it's not quite as severe as we see down here. So that implies that there is some horizontal influence, but also some vertical influence. And I'm not surprised just due to the distance between the midwoofer and the center of the tweeter right there. Can you equalize that out? No, you cannot. And there are also some other diffraction elements that's worth pointing out around three kilohertz and then another one around six to seven kilohertz. Neither of those can be equalized out. And that's going to be a bigger issue for most of you, especially if you have a very highly reflective room. This is the estimated in-room response, which gives us an idea of the overall tonality. And if I put a trend line down on here, well, I had a little bit of trouble figuring out where to put the trend line. And these things, the location of the trend line is gonna be subjective. And I usually will try to base them on what I remember hearing in my listening test. I always listen first and then I measure. And then most of the time I'll go back and re-listen again and I'll compare all my notes. So in this particular case, I looked at my notes and I remember seeing that I complained about some upper mid-range brightness. And then I said, well, I also had an issue with the lower mid-range being a little bit too mellow. So I just said, all right, I'm gonna draw the line kind of between those two points. And you can compare those two on your own if you want. This data is gonna be on my website or you can just pause the video. But we can clearly see again that there is gonna be higher treble, higher high frequency response. And you're gonna have trouble equalizing that out. That's really due to this region right here where their directivity is kind of doing some weird things and it's no longer uniform. Now, if we go to the ultra speaker, it's more smooth. And if I show the trend line, again, more smooth. And this really, I think, gives a good idea of what I was hearing in room. The on-axis response is a little bit boosted up in this particular area, and I believe that I had a complaint about that in my notes. I'd have to go double check again. And then the mid-range, a little bit of a minor scoop, but not as severe as the prime speaker. But the higher frequency area looks okay. It looks within reason. There's a little bit of a bump in this three to four kilohertz area relative to the one to two kilohertz area. If you listen to the speaker on axis in a room that doesn't have any kind of acoustic treatment, then this black line that represents a higher high frequency level compared to the mid range indicates that it's gonna sound a bit bright in room. So if you tow them out and point them 30 degrees off axis, so facing straight out into the room, back of the speaker parallel with the wall, that will help knock down some of that high frequency. Radiation of these speakers is similar, but not quite the same. The prime is very wide, 
very, very wide, about plus or minus 80 degrees at some points, plus or minus 70, probably on average. And then the Ultra is maybe a little bit more narrow, but just by a smidgen. You know, it really just depends on how you're looking at the data to get that. But we can also see there's more energy sent to the back on the Prime compared to the Ultra as well. Vertically, where do you need to sit for the Prime? Uh, 15, plus or minus 15 degrees, probably okay. Just make sure you're on that tweeter axis or you're just above or just below it for the Ultra. About the same, I would say. I mean, it's, it's a little bit better vertically, but it's roughly the same vertically in terms of where you need to sit. Distortion for the Prime at 96 decibels. Distortion for the Ultra at 96 decibels. And you notice the difference in this mid-range. I'm gonna go back to the Prime. With the Prime, it has some sort of higher order distortion. Not sure what's causing that. Are you gonna hear it? Possibly. Is it a sign of maybe a speaker that could use some work? Yes. On the low end, both of these speakers show good distortion until about 60 hertz or so. Go back to the Ultra. Yeah, until about 60 hertz or so. If we look at the Prime, multi-tone distortion actually looks pretty good. It doesn't hit 3% until just around about 800 hertz or so and a little bit of it. And then there is some sort of ringing going on around about four kilohertz or so, three, four kilohertz or so. Now, if we go to the Ultra, we can see it's a similar story. Distortion looks reasonably low there. So not a lot really to get concerned about. What happens if you use these speakers with a subwoofer and cut them off at 80 hertz? If we look at the Ultra and then the Ultra at 80 hertz and above, we can see that it drops the mid-range distortion. So that's good. If I look at the Prime and then drop the 80 hertz and above, not a whole lot better. Compression for the Prime, pretty good uh, at reasonable output levels, but if you crank it to 102 decibels at three meters away for the pair in your room, this purple line, you're gonna start having issues. What about the Ultra? Same thing. And actually, ironically, the Ultra does look just a smidgen worse in some regards. I would say the compression data is kind of a wash between these two. Now, neither one of them can go extremely high levels without needing a subwoofer. Otherwise, you're gonna run into some nonlinearity issues. These higher frequency distortions, they stand out to me. I don't recall hearing them, but it's been probably a year, if not more, since I've listened to either one of these speakers and I don't have anything about it in my notes, so I guess it didn't bother me. And that's it for the data. I think just my conclusion, my wrap up, and it's really not a big surprise, the Ultra is the better speaker. It's more linear out of the box, Towing it off axis by about 30 degrees gives a nice, pretty dang smooth in-room response as well. Based on these, I wish it got lower, but the sensitivity that you get around 87 decibels, that's pretty good. That's the trade-off that you're making. SVS sells a lot of subwoofers. It's no surprise that they're not making these bookshelf speakers to extend to 40 hertz and sacrificing a lot of sensitivity by their subwoofers to go along with it. Radiation width on these speakers is about the same. It's pretty wide, I would say. You know, normally I'm in that 60 degree radiation window where that's kind of my sweet spot personally. 70 degrees, okay. 80 degrees is kind of like, eh, maybe that's a little bit too wide. So I would recommend these speakers be used if you have some good acoustic treatment on the walls maybe. And I think that will also help some of the issues with the off-axis response relative to the diffraction. That might help tame some of those reflections in the room and maybe make the on-axis response sound more similar to the off-axis response reflections, possibly. If you own either of these two speakers, I would really be curious to see what you think about the data and how it matches up with what you've heard and what I've heard. Because really that's what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to convey objectively without just giving you an opinion, how well a speaker performs or where it's better placed or where it's better suited or what its limitations are in an objective manner. So when you're able to say, this is what I heard, then we can look at that and try to figure out things. If it, if it disagrees or if it agrees, hey, that's kind of cool too. If you enjoy this video or if you enjoy what I'm trying to do here, if you don't mind, please give this video a like and hit subscribe if you haven't already. I have a Patreon if you want to join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I also will throw, I think, some affiliate links in the comments below. If you're interested in buying either one of these speakers, maybe you were on the fence and like, okay, now I've decided I want to get this one. If you don't mind using one of my affiliate links, that would be great. If you want to say that I'm shilling and I'm only hyping products up because I want to sell them, nope. I've already told you what I think about these speakers, the good and the bad, but I'm just saying, if you're going to buy them anyway, 
please consider using my affiliate link. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.